Hi everyone, it's Sandra, and it was 113 days ago that I saved some very dried out worm cocoons that had sat for months in some dried out potting soil, and I put them in some moist coconut core. I dribbled some banana juice on them, and I sat them for a while. After about 50 days, so about 64 days ago, I looked into the worm science research and I found out that the microbial mixture is going to help those cocoons hatch. So on advice of my friend Anne, I introduced a nanny worm. So that was 64 days ago. Her work was to increase the microbial signature of the mix so that any cocoons that are viable, which means they can spring back to life, they will get the microbial signature down that little tunnel of the worm cocoon and they will know that there are resources on the outside that the microbes are building it is safe to mature and come out so the worm science shows that there's actually some sampling that goes on from a worm cocoon to the outside is it moist enough is it warm enough is there a microbial mixture that's conducive to the survival of the wisps so let's just go in here, check on Nanny. Now, you know how worm wisps like to hide out on the top, so I always like checking the top bubble paper and I've had to use carbon that couldn't have worm cocoons on it. So that's why you see old envelopes here. Just looking for wisps and I know they can be very tiny. So just looking for wisps before I put this carbon to one side. This is the side their wisp would most likely be on. No sign of wisps. I'm not liking the feeling of this material. It's feeling kind of dry. It's not dry, but it's less moist than it can be. Coconut coir is very moisture retentive. I think Nanny will be fine. It's moist enough, but it's not, uh, it's not maybe moist enough for cocoon development. There's a cocoon right on the surface. I'm not, I'm not seeing the dimple in it that it's hatched, but my worm science research also said that cocoons that aren't viable will develop a fungus. Now they either develop a fungus after the cocoon has died and fungus grows on the surface or perhaps the fungus kills the cocoon. The scientists weren't sure but I'm seeing no sign of that. The cocoon did not look glossy, shiny, but it also didn't look dead. Now I've been feeding Nanny in the center here. So I've been giving her little tiny, the white bits out of peppers and some tissue. So there's the tissue in a clump. Also, I gave her a little bit of I don't think that was tomato, something else with a skin. Oh, it was the top of a kiwi, I think. All right, so no sign of nanny near the tissue or the old top of the kiwi. So you can see how the tissue stands out from the rest of the bin. So just putting that aside. Come on, nanny, where are you? Now, obviously she's eaten what's in the center Maybe I'm not feeding enough for one worm. There's a chance that I'm not feeding enough. I didn't want to overfeed her. Uh, it's another big cocoon just sitting there, not hatched yet. Let's look for Nanny. Like I said, this material is not moist, but it's not dry either. Oh, 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 this is not Nanny. There's a baby. It's a big baby. Oh my goodness. Our first baby, 113 days. Well, we don't know when uh, it hatched. My last check-in was at 95 days. So there you go. The worm science said that cocoons of Icinia fetida, the red wigglers, could remain dormant for uh, well, it wasn't the maximum, but they noted that after 230 days, their cocoons came back to life when conditions improved. That is a big baby, which gives me a couple hints. First, it did not hatch yesterday. And secondly, and you know, looking at the big size of that cocoon that I just saw, um, that meant the this wisp is from my, um, 
native composting worm, Arcturostrotus vancouverensis, which at maturity can grow 14 to 16 inches long. There's our first baby. All right, wow. Now I'm gonna put the baby up on that cardboard that I set aside. Yeah, so the, the cocoons of my native worms are larger, are larger than red wiggler cocoons. And I wasn't sure in my potting mixes, I have castings from both species. So the cocoons, like see, to me, that looks like a red wiggler cocoon, but that other one that I saw definitely looked bigger. Let's see if there were more than one wisp. It's gonna be a little hard to find and it concerns me that I haven't found Natty yet. Come on, where could you be? I'm just pushing the material aside. Uh, you know how worms like to run in the corners and that cocoon there, look at that. Very amber looking, very, very amber looking. Wow. All right, let's look. We've got to find Nanny. That's my primary, I didn't, oh, oh. There's another baby, another baby. This one much closer to hatching just recently. Little tiny baby. Now, again, don't know if that's an Icinia um, fetida or Icinia andri, or it's one of my Arcturostrotus vancouverensis because this is just a little baby. I'm gonna put it over with the other one I took out. I've just put them on the envelopes that are moist and there's castings on them. Here's another cocoon that looks amberish. Yay, 113 days. So what I did is I increased the microbial mixture. I, I not only by putting little bits of food in this coconut core, but also the nanny worm. And we're, we're all anxious to find nanny she obviously has spread microbes through here. This does not look like coconut choir anymore. There is another baby. Now we, and this baby is about the same size as the second baby, baby number two. So this tells me that we've had at least two cocoons emerge because that first wisp was far larger than the second two. So the second two um, this one could very well have come out of the same, the same cocoon as number two. So put that over there. Wow. And the wisps were found in different areas of the bedding. And to me, that means they'd been in here a little while to travel around. And they weren't in the center where I have been putting the food. Okay, I'm looking carefully. And obviously, my main concern at this point is where is Nanny? Like I said, it is drier in here than it has been in the past. There's one of the big cocoons that comes out of Arcturostrotus vancouverensis. They're big worms, big cocoons. So again, I put Nanny worm in here 64 days ago. I've been giving Nanny small but regular feedings. This coconut choir is definitely looking like it has darkened significantly, meaning Nanny has been spreading microbes throughout. And that is, has obviously paid off. The cocoons, there's another one, very amber looking, are starting to mature. No hint that Nanny's discontent and tried to escape there's another cocoon that looks like it is darkening up. I think we're gonna have a bit of a population explosion in here. We already have three worms. Let's look to see, first of all, look to see if Nanny is, is alive and well. All right, looking for Nanny and looking for, oh, 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 another wisp, another wisp. Now this wisp, I'll leave it on this finger, is very small. I don't, I, I know this wisp did not come from the same cocoons as the first, or number two and number three. That wisp is much smaller. 
So there we go. We've got at least three uh, cocoons have developed. That tells me, as somebody who, you know, is looking at data, we've got three cocoons that have hatched at approximately the same timeline. You know, they did not hatch after 14 days. They did not hatch after 30 days. They did not hatch after 60 days. Like they weren't coming in one at a time. At least three cocoons emerged somewhere between 95 days and 113 days. So is that that the microbe mixture of this, of this container finally reached the uh, threshold that cocoons need to come out? I think that is a safe hypothesis that Nanny's been in here spreading her her microbial goodness. I still haven't found Nanny. I hope she's just hiding in the corner. Uh, so is it that the microbes need to build up to a certain amount? Now this has implications for springtime. With worms, uh, the researchers looked at winter conditions for their dehydration potential on worm cocoons and found that you know, like I said, the cocoons after rehydration bounce back to life after two weeks after being dormant for 230 days. Now, but let's just look at wild conditions. Spring comes gradually. Temperatures warm gradually. So when you look at the microbe mixture of the surroundings, it's going to build um, slowly. Uh, in, in this climate, because we essentially go into a refrigerator all winter long. Our temperatures m are mostly not below the freezing threshold, but it's just like keeping milk in the fridge. It's kind of that temperature. And so microbes don't really grow at that temperature. So soil has to warm and the microbes have to build up enough for worms to get that handshake and here's nanny and she is big there she is yay nanny you've done your job there's our nanny worm she has been in here spreading those microbes and telling the worms it's safe to come out i'll put her in this pile she she can disappear into the bit that i've gone through so it looks like my cocoons did much the same thing, not intentionally, I didn't know, mean it to happen this way, but what's happened is the microbes, it's not the temperature, it's not the humidity, but it was the microbes, in my opinion, that was the determining factor, the microbes from Nanny, um, eating the food that I'd given her and then spreading castings around, it's the microbes that were the determining factor. They needed to reach a critical threshold. And I think the same thing happens in the spring that you've got soil that's essentially, the microbes are, are not gone. They're just not a sufficient level for the worms to recognize that it is safe for these cocoons that have been dormant all winter to emerge. And look at, there's another wisp. This looks like it could be, um, it could be from the same cocoon as uh, number four. That's a small, smaller wisp. So I've got one big, it's just like Goldilocks. I've got one big wisp. I've got two medium sized wisps and I've got two tiny wisps. So that still indicates at least three cocoons have emerged. And it looks like the worms are not going to be able to get much more from this kiwi skin. Uh, so I need to give a good feeding. So let's treat this like a mini worm bin. I am going to let this experiment run a little bit longer to see how many wisps we can get from those dried up cocoons. So first some carbon. Treat it just like a mini worm bin. This is a page from my friend Peggy Heblings from Peggy Heblings Garden What You've Got. You know, find ways to repurpose, recycle, reuse. This is a tissue that I um, that I wiped around the inside of bowls that we uh, defrosted some strawberries. And so they're pink from the strawberry juice. 
And so I'll put the old feeding on top. And then I've got some pumpkin. So we should be able to attract a party with pumpkin to this area. And then a little bit of tissue on top. I'm glad I ripped up that tissue because I don't want the babies to get lost in the corners uh, of a clump of Kleenex. So there we go. And because this material is looking a little dry, I might put a little bit more moisture in here away from the feeding zones. How exciting. All right, so now I'm gonna put a little bit more moisture in here. I should have a mister bottle, but we're moving and everything is packed away. I don't think you, I can overdo it with the coconut cord. It will absorb that just fine. Okay, now let's go find our worms. They were on here, hiding in, hiding in the paper. And they are gonna be hard to spot. There's our bigger one, found its way into the, the bigger envelope. So now I'll just put it in the middle. That's fine. There's one of the little ones. So yeah, the little they're all on here. Trust me, there was nowhere else they could go. Uh, there's our piece of bubble wrap. So how exciting. So somewhere between 95 and 113 days, we had the emergence of viable wisps. So this tells me if you've got a worm bin that's dried out inadvertently or like I did some potting soil that sat out in a hot summer and dried out, don't give up on those worm cocoons. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.